All right, good morning. Good morning, guys. Early morning in Bangalore, trying to figure out traffic and stuff. Too scattered, but that's all right. Thank you, Zainab, for the introduction. So, uh, um, and pleasure to be here this morning. Today's the talk is a front-end architect's diary, building, rebuilding a website called freecharge.in, and that's the company that I work for. Before I start, how many of you have heard about Freecharge? How many of us have used it? Good. So, so uh, before I get started, I just wanted to uh, set a small little context in terms of what I'm trying to do in the next 35 odd minutes uh, over here. So this session is actually um, a very heart-to-heart -heart conversation about what I and my team went through in rebuilding uh, freecharge.in as an application from what it used to be to what it is today. So what this session is really not as to how we change the world by applying crazy front end engineering technologies to build something which nobody else has built. This session is not about that. This session is also not about how we have solved all the problems that any front end engineering team will have to solve. This is more of a, a dialogue, more of an honest confession of what really went into building a, a website like Freestyle Lion. It's a startup, it's a small company, it needs to do certain things at certain pace and time. So this is sharing mine and my team's experience in what went into building freecharge.in from what it used to be to what it is today. So, so let's get started and I'm just going to wait for the people that are getting in to settle down for like about a minute or so. So till people settle down, my name is Harish. I sort of uh, take care of UX and front end uh, at Freecharge. Uh, most of the work is done by my team. I tend to bring coffee and help them out to do uh, what is needed for the company. And I also play music with a band called Agam. And like Zainab says, I'm a very nice guy overall. And before this, I did some front-end geekery at Mintra.com. And before that, I spent a whole lot of time in Adobe doing a whole bunch of things. The last one being a web and open standards evangelist uh, across doing general web and open standards goodness. That's what I was doing. Uh, before this. All right. Can you read this at the back? Is it clear? The text is clear? Sure. So I just want to start by sharing a couple of thoughts very quickly. If there was one right way of building a front-end system, then you actually need just one guy and just replicate his work. And most of us can actually go find other modes of employment. So there is no one right way of doing front-end engineering. So that also sets context in terms of that's also my defense, right? So I chose to do it one way, but that doesn't mean that's the only way. But that also doesn't mean that uh, it is. So it is a very, very debatable topic in terms of how a system should be uh, engineered or architected. That's the first point that I want to make before I get started. And the next one being, there's a code of conduct, so please read it. So if we actually know, once we have set these two contexts, I think we are ready to um, get rolling. So let's see. So I'm going to get started by speaking a little bit about the free charge world, the world that I am in, the world that my colleagues are in, the product that we're trying to build. So free charge, as we all know, is a website that helps you um, expedite or do your utility payments, your recharge bills, your DTH bills, your um, postpaid bills, and so on and so forth, and do it pretty uh, pretty quickly and more reliably. That's our world. But having said that, it's a very, very uh, polyglot, amazing world. So the typical free charge customer is somebody that we all need to understand and kind of move forward. I'm just going to pause again and let these guys settle down. Okay, guys, let's look at the typical free charge customer. So let's look at the exhibit A. That is the category one. You can, can't read that blue too well. It is the typical Yangistan, oh yes, Abhi generation of our country who are always short on balance and significantly short on patience. And uh, that is how they typically write back to you. Can you read that? So that's how they are. That's, that's our first category of users that a product like us that needs to cater to and kind of 
support. The second category is the the larger majority in cities and small towns, which is the working women, and men, and the awesome people who pretty much have a lot of things: computers, iPads, tablets. I don't know. So they are looking for speed, a very good experience, and generally awesome. They look for things that are awesome and things that really work and and just get their work done. The third category, which is the most common category, is what the typical common person who is eternally skeptical about spending money online. He would actually, while pulling out 10 rupees from his wallet, he will actually lose 5 rupee coin on the ground and he will forget to pick that up. But the same 5 rupee, if I ask him to spend on my website, he will not. He will say, no, he will not. So that is the, the main the main larger subset of people that we are dealing with in a, in a business like ours. So even if that money costs less than a cigarette or a chai, they will be very, very skeptical to spend the money. And we have some other generally awesome categories of people that could prospectively use our product like. So, yeah. And uh, what's also important is the choices that they make, right? Like, you know, I mean, you don't know what their their product usage or design choices are. So you could, you want people that actually want this and people that are actually having this. So th this is why building a front-end system, build, architecting or designing a front-end system for a product like free charge becomes an extremely difficult problem because there is no one right way of doing this because you have all sorts of people, literally all sorts of people recharging their phones or doing utility payments. So that is the challenge that we are attempting to solve as we move forward. So for the tech geeks, it's like, you know, like your own version of WebKit or your own version of Chromium versus somebody who just says IE6 just works and I will just continue using that. So both of them are very valid pertinent choices. How much ever we frown on somebody's choice of what runtime he wants to use, the world is really like that. You cannot really force people to one way or the other, right? So Clearly, one size does not fit all our users. So, which also means we have to now prioritize on the user's success, the speed, and the ease of use. So, what that leaves us is the very, very simple three points. And if you speak to any product that gets built, they all, after all this ceremonious intro, will come back to this point or a, or a variant of this. So, everybody has to focus on these three points, and, and we are no different. And from there, I'm going to start jumping into a little bit of what went into building the system. So when when uh, we started rebuilding FreeCharger IN, we have to look at what we had before. So what we had was a classic old website, which which really really worked. It was servicing a whole lot of transactions a day, but it was built on Java stack. It didn't have a whole lot of front end goodness or front end engineering that went into it. It was just a typical HTML website that was driven by a Java backend. Like, you know, the HTML gets passed from the backend and, and get stuff. So where we wanted to go was to build a, a services driven single page application which is fast, snappy, no nonsense and it should sort of work and feel like this. So, so considering that is our that is our aspiration, it's very important to uh, now start looking at three main parameters. One is, well, we have decided to become a front-end heavy company. We're going to actually go and do all this magical front-end stuff and then build a great product. But then look back, oh, we have like three engineers and two months to ship. So which is which is my world. I don't have we don't have like 10, 20 people that we are deploying to work for uh, months to get this product. So Making a technology stack decision um, is also driven not only by what technologies are available, but what is it that we can adopt and what is it that we can reliably adopt and use. So it's a constant battle that we fought to um, to figure out what what is it that we want to do. So the questions are like, oh, you hired a guy that is not using Backbone JS? Well, uh, he must be one of those guys. So this is the typical world, right? Like there's enough support for Backbone, there's enough support for Angular, or probably there are tons of other frameworks that's coming forward, but the larger question for a person like me have to answer with my team is, well, all that is there, but is that what we will be able to use? Is that what we will be able to put forward to build our system? So we ended up doing our front end stack by hand rolling a stack which does not create technology lock-in. So 
Uh, this is something which people uh, from smaller agile companies would really understand. So it's very important to keep your technology stack uh, a little agnostic to any specific platform. Even if you speak about backbone Wrangler, see I came from Adobe, so I mean I, uh, before I, I so I, I would clearly know what lock-in would mean and what that would cost. So I was working on Flex and what Flex typically created was a whole bunch of developers that just knew how to build on Flex. So the moment that technology tapered down, a whole lot of people did not know how to program because they didn't know the stack. So for a company of our size, we were very, very particular that we create as as much stack agnostic programming structures as possible where if we have new entities, new bodies coming to the system, they will be able to pick it up and start running with it. So, so for that, this is our first component. So we are using a framework called stapes.js. Uh, Stapes is uh, relatively new. I would say a fairly new library. I don't. I don't even know if there are a whole lot of applications that is running on Stapes. But then now we are running on Stapes. It's a fairly supremely lightweight, very no nonsense MVC container. It's two KB minified in GZIP, and what it gives you is MVC custom events and classes, and it is beautiful in a way that. It has got a very, very low learning curve. If you actually work with jQuery and if you actually work with classic JavaScript, it hardly takes you time to ramp up and understand how to build a, a, a very simple application and get started on stage. So the reason why we, we did that was that whenever we actually acquire new people into our team, whenever we actually have more and more people working on a project, we wanted to create a base stack that does not require people to be sent to trainings or sent to ramp up. And all that would mean is we have a lot of traditional engineers who are not your front-end engineers. These are people that code in PHP, people that program in Java, and they don't necessarily have a whole lot of understanding or appreciation of the, the, the cutting-edge front-end, and nor do they really care whether something is moving the needle or not. So it is important to build a framework or choose a framework that allows them to very quickly jump in and add features and don't necessarily rely on the three or four front-end, the true front-end engineers uh, in a company. So. Uh, so a whole bunch of people work on front-end at free charge, not just the front-end engineers, the people who are actually writing some of the core functionality who still contribute to the front-end. So this was a, a choice that we made. And of course, recharge utility payment application would typically mean you have tons of forms and tons of validation, literally tons of them. So uh, a Sun Direct DTH starts with a one and has nine characters and won't accept numbers between X and Y between a certain period in time for the better. Or you have postpaid numbers that will allow decimal points that don't allow decimal points. And you have all sorts of crazy matrices of validations that you have to write. So the choice really is between, okay, let's write our validations. Or the choice is to go and uh, choose a library that would do it for you. So we ended up choosing Parsley.js. Anybody who's used Parsley here? One person. You should actually check this library out. It's pretty nice. So it actually pretty much does everything that uh, an average internet application validation scheme would require. And it has got some really, really good API support to write your custom validations and kind of bake them into your code. And it kind of just works really, really well. So, And it's not a very, very big library. It is not small either, but it's a very nice library to look at. So, so just circling back, so we have tapes as our our backbone, like you know, our MVC, our classes, the whole control and the model layer is actually written in this. Our validations are actually triggered by Fossily.js. Templates are bread and butter. So we are on mustache.js. No specific reason as to why mustache, but then mustache just works for us. But there are tons of other templating libraries that you could possibly look at when you're building your system. So Mustache is what we are using, and there's a jQuery adapter on top of Mustache, which kind of plays really nice with jQuery. And of course, Bootstrap. So Bootstrap powers free charges, layouts, UI, and all the visual components. And we started out with Bootstrap 2.3, and soon we moved uh, to Bootstrap 3. And most of our, uh, pretty much almost all our UI on what you see on free charge or runs uh, on, on Bootstrap. So Cool. Question time. Anybody here who has built a full responsive website? I want has to go up. Yeah, I know. 
So I'm not going to ask Kiran. So, <laughs> what was it like? Can somebody very quickly tell me what was it like? Was it fun? All the hands that went up kind of went down. I'm going to ask, how have you, have you built a full response to the website if you have? Was it fun? Yes, sir. Was it fun doing it? Sometimes it was a pain as well. And it had its own pain in the insert anatomical reference is what he says. <laughs> so he says it was fun, but it was also difficult. Somebody else, I'm just trying to understand. So, and also for me to gather in terms of what it really meant. Who else put their hand up? Here, gentlemen here. So you are mobile first and you have to understand and, and a whole lot. But then full response service, totally awesome. See, a whole bunch of people in this room will surely say, like, you know, I've been reading about it and full response service, the thing. I agree, you should totally do it. Or actually, should we do it? So this is exactly where we were and we are. I mean, actually, uh, a, a part of my brain says that, like, you know, everybody is doing full response and I've been reading, we've been reading full response is the thing to do. So we said, we are not sure, so let us actually go the full distance. So um, we sat down and said, okay, stop all this. We are going to take the website full response. It should work on all conceivable screen sizes, and it should just work really, really well. So we spent quite a bit of time actually making our site go full responsive and... Uh, We just realized that there are a whole lot of people who are on 2G networks in our country, at least our customers. A whole bunch of people who recharge are very, very quickly out of balance. I mean, I mean, I don't know who can resonate with this. People are WhatsApping like nuts, right? Or people are like SMSing like crazy. It depends upon what age group and what category of user that you belong, but people are always, always, always running out of balance. And when people run out of balance, they try to open the website on the closest possible device of theirs, like which is their mobile phone. They just want to add more balance or they want to add more data uh, uh, bytes into their So building a full responsive website the way we built it ended up being a completely sluggish, sloppy, just does not work website on mobile devices. And it, 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 it totally did not work. It was embarrassingly bad. So we just realized that the battles are sometimes as small as connectivity and sometimes much more complex as to, I don't understand how to use this. And I, I am sort of, I'm sort of used to using a mobile website in a certain way and the response to the website that we built probably did not make the cut in terms of where that is. And, and this is in all honesty, we tried, but then that's what we realized. And when we realized that we quickly decided to, what? If you're building an M dot site, you should be an idiot, right? Yes? No? Give some opinion, man. Bangalore is known to be an opinionated place. How many of us are building an M dot site for our, of your respective companies? Do you have a something.com slash M? Dude, it has to be one of the two. You don't have a responsive website. You don't have an M dot site. That means you don't have a mobile website. That's what it typically means. So, so, so if I'm just guessing the rest of you have some sort of a mobile website that, uh, that uh, works on the smaller screen. So, but apparently they are very old school and uncool and, um, it is hard for you to keep your job if you're actually building that. It actually screws your resume. So in your previous job, you actually built an M dot site and didn't go full responsive. So damn, that's not good. But then sometimes you have to step back and see what's right for your customer and not necessarily what is right for the front end engineering team. This is, this is a difficult, this was a difficult battle for me to internally fight and also for my team because we want to do something, but the customer needs something entirely different. So it is very important to kind of step back, take a deep breath and say, build what the customer really needs. And that sounded like a good idea. And we looked at solving the most common problems for a customer using a desktop web browser. So I'm going to skip through. I was, I was planning to show a demo over here, but then some really good stuff happened yesterday night when Rajesh and I were sitting in the free charge office yesterday night. So I'm going to skip this demo. Uh, towards the end, so I'm just going to skip through and uh, move forward. Customers use all kinds of browsers, all kinds of browsers. It's crazy. I mean, I mean, 
uh, when you when you just open some sort of an analytics tools and just do a slice and dice across the browsers that people are using, you will be very very wildly surprised at the sheer cross section of browsers that your customers tend to use. Anybody has experience building for all browsers here? Somebody who has actually killed the problem. I just want to see how anybody who was who's in this room solved the the quintessential browser problem. Anyone? IE6 onwards and all the way out to Chrome. Anybody know? So, but then I, <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I think we totally need to support all of them because that's what the business tells you. Because if you don't support one browser, it's X number of transactions and a small company or a company that's trying to, to build the business moving forward, losing even one transaction is potentially not a, a good idea. But then, Honestly speaking, in, in, in the years that I've spent building front-end products, um, I quite don't know how to build for all browsers. This is why I asked that question. I, I just do not know how that is done. I mean, I'm, I'm being confessional here. So we asked that question back to us by saying, why? And started to take some really, really hard calls. And, and this is important to kind of convey to you guys because people, companies of our size, people who are actually bootstrapping new products, this becomes your your hardest battle to fight because you have multiple stakeholders working and pushing you to make decisions that will actually support and help the business. But then some of these are significantly, significantly hard calls. So we said this, IE8 plus only and we just looked at the funnel and said that makes sense. So again, let's take a quick step back and see. So what does this leave us with? So our desktop website will run only IE8 and above, and of course your Firefoxes, Chrome, and Safaris of the world, which we, which is fairly easy to engineer, by the way, compared to IE8 minus. So what does this really mean? So if we had full, gone full responsive, what we are typically saying is we will not have a website that will run on IE7 or lesser. See, while that is a very, very good call to take, it typically means people that are using those browsers are not going to see. And that's where we look, took a step back and said, Running an m dot recharge dot in website, recharge dot in slash m was a good idea because it was built on a bare minimum HTML JavaScript only tech stack where it pretty much runs reliably across all these unsupported browsers. So uh, the reason why I'm, I'm I'm stating this is because sometimes we get a little carried away in terms of what what tech stack or what kind of front end product that we want to build, but it's very important to take those periodic intercepts to understand that maybe building it top of the line might not necessarily solve your business problem. Sometimes keeping those checkpoints and understand that keep a certain thing as is and move one of your project needles forward which actually help you build a more rounded product that will kind of work for everyone and experience is ranging from not so good to good but you won't have like a terry bad experience for any user. So that is the, the core point that we are trying to drive in. Now some very interesting anecdotes. So I want to, we are very awesome, like we are free charge. So, I mean, sometimes I just take the liberty of saying, I mean, the most awesome people that I have seen are, are pretty much concentrated in free charge. That's a very modest statement to make. So by that logic, whatever we build and whatever we have kind of engineered should perform awesome. So by virtue of us being awesome, stuff has to perform awesome. And The performance, sorry, performance sucked pretty bad the first time we put it out. It was slow. It was not doing anything that we wanted it to do. But we were, we were like, we were like in denial. Almost all front-end projects go through this denial phase. We're saying, yeah, most of these best practices have been kept in mind. They have already made sure that we are not writing junk code. But then the experience that we had in this project was that. Come what may, whatever you do, your first ever iteration that you're going to put out is actually going to be, um, I don't know, it, it's going to be pretty suboptimal. I mean, sometimes you, you do pull stuff that is fairly good, but in our case, no. We weren't doing any good with our, with our runtime performance the first time that we put it out. And the reasons were, the first one, the first and most critical one we identified was, we had shit loads of templates. And in the hurry of shipping and writing features, 
what we did is we just went on an overboard, overload of creating templates. Just to understand how many of us are actually doing some serious template based work on handlebars, mustache, knockouts, anyone in the room? So how many of us know what templates are before I even move forward? How many of us do not know what templates are? Let me just ask that question. Come on guys, this will help me. So there are a whole lot of people uh, who, well, <laughs> Okay, so um, templates are actually code snippets that you can reuse in your HTML uh, layout. So basically, if you have a, a component that gets gets rendered in runtime, in olden days we used to write JavaScript code that concatenates HTML tags and then do a finally a document dot write kind of a notion. But templates actually allow you to render data via layout elements via a program. So so basically, um, this talk is necessarily not about templates, but if people are interested in knowing what this is, I, I, I will very humbly request you to, to take a look at some of those um, templating languages like Mustache and Knockout. So, uh, for want of time, I'm not going to run. So, that would also mean a lot of us wouldn't know what partials are. So, but I'm just going to say it again for the people that know. So, writing partials is very, very critical to keep your, your overall template sizes really small. So, if you actually know a piece of HTML markup can be reused, please, please go ahead and write them as partials. This is something which we learned the hard way because we just went engineering and we were not really looking at, at what was happening to our code in the appropriate time. So, we uh, we moved some performance needle by doing this. Then, we didn't put any dependency management, none. We went that classic old school, like, you know, start linking your JavaScript in your, in your, uh, main HTML right at the bottom, one after the other, absolutely no dependency management. This is this is how we build. I'm not ashamed about this. We all knew uh, what dependency management systems were available, but we did not do it for whatever reason. And it came and bit us pretty, pretty hard because uh, there were caching troubles and even more terrible troubles that came because we were not really managing what sort of dependencies are needed. So. What this ended up being is that the site started performing unreliably in certain situations. I'll take you through them. And also, it started behaving reasonably sluggish despite being engineered as a single page application moving forward. So, considering we hadn't done dependency management using require or anything similar, we said, at least let's minify. We all know what minification is, right? Minification can be done multiple levels right from removing your white spaces to changing your variable name to something which is significantly more uh, deep. So, the need to minify came and another assorted build steps like concatenating your CSS, minifying, e-sipping and boom, this is where we ended up. So, we have a system which doesn't, so I mean as front end guys we use grunt for our task running and we just realized our build system doesn't support it. So, and again we came back to the same rut of saying we need to ship fast. So, what really happens is you still have a system where you do a right click and open, you can pretty much see all the code that you've written. And secondly, they are not compressed and they are not performing well for your website. So, let's say, let's go with versioning, at least the, the caching issues that we had with the, because of the, because of the dependency management not being there. So, typically what happens is in front end projects, you keep changing your JavaScript, right? Every day when you're fixing bugs, you keep changing your JavaScript, but most of the modern browsers cache your JavaScript, right? So, when the next time you do a release, your new changes will not be available for a certain set of users. This is what we mean by site breaking because of changes. So, when you have a dependency management system, it will internally take care of that. But here we said we don't have that. So, let us go version every single reference that we have on the website from templates to JavaScript to CSS. That's pretty terrible because your cache is always busted. So, the performance gain that you will get by actually caching a resource is completely lost because every single request will fetch a new copy of your JavaScript and template. So, that's pretty terrible. So, we pondered this. How about we do a manifest driven versioning where you have a manifest file where you tell what are the files that need to be picked up from the cache or what are the ones that you need to uh, redeploy as new versions. And every single time you do a versioned manifest file, you have to version the manifest file now and the manifest will actually parse the templates and the JavaScript that you need to load and then appropriately load the stuff. So, 
all this is happening primarily because we moved the feature development needle in a way that we didn't factor in dependency management as a first step. So my my key takeaway was that if you understand that you're going to build a full full blown single page application, it is important that you you get some of these thoughts going in your head. It could be any one of these, but not thinking about it, which is a mistake that we did for whatever reason, kind of cost us pretty dearly, and we had to kind of literally spend time to come kind of go back and fix that. So. So that is that. SEO geeks in the room. How many of us are? Let me see. I mean, I, I, guys, come on. How many of us have built a single page app that has SEO support here? Nobody? One person? How many of us are building single page apps? Entirely JavaScript driven. So no SEO support, sir? No, okay. No SEO? Alright. So, um, there's a very interesting anecdote, right? So, I mean, when I was working at, uh, when I was working at Adobe and then I took the job at Mintra, I quite didn't know what SEO really meant for a company. Because I came from a large company and, uh, SEO was taken care of. But suddenly I came to e-commerce after a very long time in a shrink wrap product software company. SEO became such an important facet that for front end engineering teams, it almost pushes you to a level where you cannot even build a single page app because your SEO will be broken. Because your business is driven by SEO. People are actually coming to your website via Google searches and you just cannot build a single page app because it doesn't play really well with search engines. And it's a, it's a terrible, terrible place to be and I'm hoping uh, the leading search engine service providers are actually listening and kind of put an end to the situation, not having front end engineers struggle through this. So we started solving this by asking this question, let us set up a phantom.js system. So who knows what phantom.js here is? That's pretty good. Anybody who set it up in their workplaces? Look, I have. And and it's monumentally difficult to maintain that thing. It is, it is, it is pretty good. It will allow you to do your stuff. But then 10? Yeah. I saw zero. <laughs> 10 more minutes. Okay. So we set up setting up phantom.js and phantom.js what it typically does it's a headless browser which actually renders your html and hands off the control to your search engine crawlers a pre-rendered page while ajax single page applications are rendered after the page is loaded so you don't have any content for search engine which is why seo breaks so we asked this question to ourselves why don't we do this it sounded like a plan but we just realized it's going to take a whole lot of time which actually ended up us researching and finding out what other solutions are there. So there is a product called SEOJS. It's actually free and it's doing what, uh, it, it's like a phantom JS on cloud which will actually do your your SEO page generation on the cloud and it was free and we thought it was awesome. While it is really awesome, it did not work. And there is clearly no support for this thing and uh, the emails went to some mailbox that I'm sure that the developer does not check and there was uh, or a special folder called trash I don't know what that is but then um, that didn't work so that took us to the the next available option which is called brombond.js urge you guys to go and check brombond.js it's not a free service uh, it's a subscription model which actually SEO enables your single page application it's Rajesh King it's like 39 bucks a month it's about $39 a month for a set of pages, the number of pages that you have on a website. They have other plans as well. And that worked and we thought that was very important to kind of put into our system. So we did that. The mistakes that we made were that we think that us thinking that we got it right the first time. And subsequently, sorry. What a bummer. The second time and third time. So we continued making mistakes, but the point was that it is important to realize that you're making mistakes. So when you're actually building, this is probably not, this is not even from a design standpoint, it's from an engineering standpoint. It's important to understand that you are making mistakes. When you make a mistake the first time, you have to still push a second time, still make mistakes, push a third time and still make mistakes. The problem that's happening is if, if as front end engineers, we start getting averse to making mistakes, it's going to be a little difficult. So, the, we, we made several mistakes and all we did is we started 
learning that we haven't gotten it fully right yet. As of today also we have a product out there and we clearly know that we haven't gotten it entirely right. But then we are making, we are making everything in our capacity to kind of do that. So iterating quickly and failing quickly is another very, very key learning that I personally got that iterations are painful. It's painful for engineers, painful for designers, painful for everyone, but it's very important to iterate, iterate quickly and fail quickly. So we did this attempt and we had issues. We did this attempt and we still had issues and just gonna and then we did this. So this is where we are as free charge right now and uh, it takes care of a whole bunch of things. It takes care of our SEO, you have a whole bunch of very useful user con. So one important thing about SEO is like nobody wants to keyword stuff. Your customers hate websites that keyword stuff. Your customers actually need useful information while still contributing to the SEO value of your company. So that is the reason why we ended up building a, a multi-score website. It's live at freecharge.in right now. I would request you guys to take a look at that and I have like five more minutes to go. So I just wanted to show you one small little demo of what we have been doing. Uh, post all these exercises and post all these learnings and we are just going to show you a small demo in terms of how we are pushing the front end needle forward, helping the customer building a, a front end application. Let me see if the, the internet is working, otherwise I'm, I will have to run it off my local, I'm just going to give it a shot. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is the, is the net running? I can see it is. Terrible. So I'm going to. So what I'm going to show you is um, already available on the internet. Once we are done with this talk, you guys can give a spin to the new free charge or IN. And uh, the demo that I'm going to show is um, you have you have a you have a free charge account and we also have a concept called free charge credit which is similar to your flipkart wallet or any of those uh, cash holding devices that you have so i have let me just look i have some money in my free charge credits so let's see how much i have i have about 850 rupees in my credits and i also have some transactions that i have done in the past in free charge so what really happens is we are trying to reduce the number of inputs that the user has to do when he's recharging. People hate typing in numbers. People hate choosing their operators. People don't want to do any of that. People just want to recharge. So if let's say you have already recharged, I'm just going to recharge this number again. So when I click this, you get something called the free charge turbo and all you need to do is click the recharge now button. You're paying, your payment is done. We are waiting for recharge, it actually will recharge that phone, so we are still waiting for the AG to send us a response back, there you go, done, done. So this is what, this is what we are trying to do with free charge, so if you are trying to recharge, you are out of balance, there is no time for ceremonious typing, validating, did you enter your number right, are you sure this is there too, we don't have time for that shit, right, nobody wants to do all that. Oh, looks like I got your number wrong, looks like your number needs 10 characters, none of that. You just click a button and the beauty is, like I said, when people are paying money, see in reality you saw that rocket flying and one pop-up, you don't need any of that, really. What you re but what really helps people in an online transaction space is to tell them that, look, I know what I'm doing, look, stuff is happening. So it's very important to tell the user, this is something which we learn as a, and, and, and Soon after this, Rajesh is going to come and talk to you guys. He'll actually throw in more insights in terms of why some of these UI patterns are important. It is because it induces trust in the user that, hey, I am doing something right now and that's finished. I am doing something else and hey, your payment is done. You could just simply show a spinner and say, paying and then send him back. Sometimes these kind of small little integrities help the user feel very, very confident about uh, the product that they are using. And we are doing, this is how we are pushing the feature needle forward. This talk's real intention is not to pimp what free charge is doing and it's, a, it's an open public website. I recommend you guys to go and check and give it a spin and, and, and let us know what you thought about it. And let me quickly move forward. I'm done. 
I just have two more slides. So our mission is to always build a product that delights your customer and not just your boss. It typically, uh, it's, it's something that I, uh, something that my boss believes in, my, the whole company believes, I believe in, and, and the, and the team that I work with, uh, some of them are already here. I mean, I, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, those guys are, the guys who build free charge are in the room, okay? I'm gonna point, uh, you guys to them at the end of this talk. So this is something which is very important that we realize to keep your egos as front end engineers aside and build a product that is good for your customer and not just your boss. The peak to the future is done. Do I have time for like, Couple of questions. I have time. I have two minutes. I mean, I'm 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 happy to take questions. Yes, sir. Didn't work in the second attempt. Didn't work in the second attempt. Also, didn't work. Uh, what is your definition of work? Are we so measuring? what really happens is, uh, so uh, products of our nature are typically evaluated on what it is doing for the customer. So anything else actually comes far lower in your in your pecking cycle. So when we put the first version out. If you, if I, it's such a pity I can't pull the screen back again. We did a whole lot of things there. So we had like a, 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 a mini dashboard on the left, which actually gave you all the recharge tools. And we actually built a place where you could actually see your account data, a whole bunch of recent transactions. And what we realized is that we provided everything for the customer, but he clicked on nothing. He just didn't get it. So you could argue that it was basically probably a UX problem. Let's say we can argue that it's a design problem, but design problems are never isolated from front end engineering problems. I believe they are, they're very, very complementary. They don't run in orthogonal trajectory. So that didn't work. The second one that we put out was a very clean, white, big forms website, but people didn't know why should I recharge in this website. So largely things like simple value proposition, trust symbols, or like, you know, certain responsivities when you click a button that stuff is happening, all those things were lacking and the site had some of the performance issues that I mentioned, like whether had cash busting issues and so on and so forth. So the, so we when we iterated we started looking at each one of these and started figuring out what else can we do and and so the, the definition of working is your customer being successful. So we don't even know if the third one is working or not. It is like two and a half days old. But we're hoping it's gonna work slightly better than the previous one and we we'll learn moving forward. So that's that. One more question I think I can take one more question. Yes sir. So, uh, how do you uh, user test your uh, presentations? Taken so, how do we user test? So, we um, we recently started A/B testing, and as much as I am ashamed saying that we were not A/B testing since a very long time, and we started doing fairly complex A/B testing and feature gating only recently. So, we do two things. So, basically, we have a simple A-B test framework, which is a standard A bar B. You get version 1 for a set of users and a version 2. And we also have a feature gating system where you have an internal code element where you can actually gate features on login information or based on which browser he's coming from. So, for example, a whole bunch of people will get a different UI with both postpaid and prepaid, but you can actually give the same UI, which is actually sliced and diced across multiple features or multiple trajectories through a feature gating mechanism. That's what we are doing. and uh, we're still evaluating uh, what are the other uh, A-B testing or feature getting methodologies we can adopt. And uh, we are still in the infancy of figuring out. I, I have been in the past in a very significantly strongly instrumented organization, but we are trying to build that at FreeShare right now. I'm still in the infancy. Thank you, Prabhu. Do we have one more question before I sign out? Uh, we have, we have, sure. I, I'm, I'm coming to you. I, I just, sure. Question is more on the... Uh philosophy behind uh, going for a one page app uh, did that give you anything significant what was the decision process in uh, going for that I'm, I'm i'm really glad you asked that question so his question is why did we choose to build a single page app in the first place and what was the uh, was that just uh, a, a choice that we had to move so i mean i'll answer you in two parts so basically a company like free charge the ui is actually just the 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 the, the carriage that takes the product to the customer so basically what really drives a product like FreeCharge is the ability to do a successful recharge. So there's a whole bunch of backend geekery that goes on it, kind of. So what really happened is, servicifying that backend is absolutely required because FreeCharge is diversifying itself into web, into mobile web, into mobile apps, and probably into tablet. And it is absolutely not possible to run with a system which is not service. So when you have a service-oriented backend, when you have an entirely service-wide backend, you will be able to build very componentized, widgetized products as part of your your larger system. And at that instance, it makes a very, very 
strong case for moving your entire thing into a single page application because eventually recharge is um, is the following. You click a button, you should get a recharge. So people don't want to see pages really. People don't want to go from recharge page to coupon page to payment page. People don't want to do that. People just want to recharge. It's it's like how you go to a shop and say, give me 20 bucks and he gives you 20 bucks. So even in, when I say that in English, it makes a whole lot of sense to say that it eventually becomes like one single rectangular screen where stuff happens and gets done. Yes, my good sir, long time no see. Thanks, um, uh, you mentioned that uh, Greg was not working in your case. Can you detail it? Yeah, so what was happening is uh, we had, uh, um, so we ha we use a, a Jenkins based build system and which is internally configured to kind of build files and minify and run and it is just that in the kind of time frame that we are operating in, we just couldn't get, so the answer is, we don't know if it will work or not, we just couldn't get it running. So whenever we actually brought Grunt into the system, all hell would break loose and our, re our releases started getting moved out and pushed out. So we still do not know what we have to do in our build engineering system, our build, the build team is still figuring out to do that. So uh, I don't have a, a, a largely useful answer for that, it's just that we couldn't figure out how it would work. And there was one last person that has to ask a question before Rajesh takes over. Thanks Rajesh for waiting. Yeah, uh, you know, so I have a small question regarding your responsive mechanism. Huh? Uh, I checked your website on mobile and it's all good. And then I checked it in the browser. I resized the browser, but it didn't work out. I mean, it's not responsive in the browser. So is there, you have, you have done something like exclusively for mobile and... I am going to answer this question in a very, very brutally honest way. If it didn't resize on the browser, you most likely found a bug. Okay, fine. <laughs> I'm on Chromium, right? <laughs> A pretty, a pretty shameful one at that, which we will fix, but we haven't done anything specific. We do have a separate mobile site, like I mentioned, so if you're actually hitting the website from a from a mobile device, it will redirect to a mobile installation. But actually, then, we are not redirected, it's your normal freecharge.in only, because I'm on iPhone, so it's not a M website. I think you just found us a bug. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, by the way, I'm, uh, hello, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm on Ubuntu 12.04, Chromium 32, right? On top of the line, so... So before I, I walk away, so thank you so much and uh, over to Rajesh. Rajesh is my compatriot at, at, at FreeCharge. He helps build the FreeCharge product. So we will be out here hanging out trying to take questions. Before I go away, I am Harish underscore IO on Twitter and Harish hyphen IO on GitHub. So Harish underscore IO on Twitter. Uh, hit us up for anything, any questions, any feedback, anything that you want to ask. Have a fantastic rest of the day and thank you so much. Big round of applause for Harish.